Australia, Josephine Holick. Welcome back to Australian Musician. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, last time we spoke was about 15 months ago uh, via Zoom. Um, the album, uh, The Real World, which is coming out on September 30, uh, was supposed to come out in 2021. Uh, what were the main factors that led to the delay? Obviously, the pandemic and the five kilometre rule. I wasn't able to come down to Melbourne to go to the studio. So that was the main thing. Um, but also just with the knowledge of the ongoing pandemic, we couldn't um, confidently release a record when there's no touring, no international travel, um, no buyer confidence in shows. We were like going into lockdowns and coming out of lockdowns like crazy. And as evidenced by, you know, um, even the start of 2022, there was, I had COVID at the start of the year. Everyone had COVID at the start of the year. Shows are still being canceled. So that was kind of, you know, I think clever timing more than anything and being sensible with an expensive record. When you began thinking about this album, there was no pandemic. Uh, it was uh, maybe three years ago. Um, is the end result uh, of the album what you envisaged from the start? It's all the same songs that we envisaged from the beginning of the process. Um, but the sound of it is probably quite different. It was quite heavily edited back in a studio here in Brunswick West at Union Street Studios with Roger Bergadaz. And some of the songs we rebuilt from the ground up, you know, we might have kept one or two things from the original recordings from Joshua Tree and actually rebuilt them here in Melbourne. So it took on quite a different shape. And I think I matured as a musician and as a person in that process of those three years. So it's probably quite a different sounding record than it would have been otherwise, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the album features Lucinda Williams' band, Buick Six, yeah. and guitar legend Greg Lease. Uh, was it hard to contain the, the fangirl feelings initially? <laughs> when they first showed up, um, we were actually at Pappy and Harriet's and we were playing a show with them at Pappy and Harriet's. And I think the playing of music in the same spaces as other musicians levels you a little bit. Um, but Greg Lease showed up the second day of recording and that um, knocked me on my ass a little bit. Yeah, I was really floored um, to meet Greg Lease because he was sort of, you know, um, a hero of mine from when I was a teenager and stuff. So yeah, that was quite the moment. Um, what kind of brief did you give these musicians? I sent demos over to them of about 20 songs and they chose the ones that they wanted to work on and I kind of, I gave them sort of like a loose idea that I wanted it to sound a bit rockier than stuff that I'd made before. I gave them some reference material. I sent them um, Gene Clark's No Other. And then when we were in the studio, there was lots of conversation and lots of like playing of tracks off the internet to be like, oh, maybe this song could have this kind of thing in it. And it was really a collaborative process of sort of um, finding a mid middle ground between Buick Six and Greg Lease's sounds and what I wanted to provide. And then on the tracks that we didn't kind of achieve that, obviously we recreated those tracks in the studio in Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. Were, were some of your band members in America as well? Yeah, so Shane Riley, who's played on a lot of my music, he's all over Feral Fusion um, and Don't Mess With The Doyen. He was over there playing steel as well. So on a few of the tracks you'll hear, hear double pedal steel, which is Greg and Shane both playing on those tracks, which was amazing. And Tom Brooks, who's playing tonight at Shot Kickers, he was over there as well. Um, playing guitar, so that was very cool. And uh, my Melbourne band feature quite heavily on the record as well, Pe members that are playing this evening and also other members that are overseas touring at the moment. So, yeah. yeah. Um, the album was recorded at Rancho de La Luna, the, yeah. the, the famous studio in Joshua Tree, uh, long before uh, you two released Joshua Tree, the, <laughs> the area had quite, quite a history. Um, it's just a, a small history lesson for the kids. Um, the, the status was gained uh, thanks to Graham Parsons, who was, uh, you, you could say, one of, if not the uh, pioneers of country rock music in America, mm -hmm. um, with, with the Birds and the Flying Burrito Brothers. He actually died in the Joshua Tree Inn uh, under dubious circumstances. Uh, his body was stolen uh, from LA Airport and then brought back to Joshua Tree and, and burned. At Cap Rock. Yeah. How far did you go down the rabbit hole of first reading about all of that? And, and did you then go and check out all the monuments? 
Well, I'd known about all that stuff for a really long time because I'm a massive fan of cosmic country music. So that was obviously, I already knew that whole history before we even went to Joshua Tree. Um, and so, yeah, we went to the Joshua Tree Inn. We saw his room. We hung out at his memorial there. Um, and, you know, there's lots of photographs and things all through there. I actually have a key tag on my keys um, of his room number from the Joshua Tree Inn. So yeah, we went pretty, we went on a deep dive down that rabbit hole. Um, we went out into the desert, we went to Cap Rock, we did all that stuff. So yeah, fangirled pretty hard over that. But it was quite emotional, which I wasn't expecting, you know, like I didn't know Graham, I've listened to his music a lot, but it was overwhelmingly like emotional kind of experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the tracks up the album, Nobody's Better Than Me and Wilderness Tunes certainly sound like they, they came out of the desert. Uh, did the desert influence your feelings at the time and in your approach to the album? Absolutely. I think I went in with like a particular sort of idea of what I wanted it to sound like, which there are elements of that still now. But those songs, um, Nobody's No Better Than No One, pretty much all happened in Joshua Tree. Wilderness Tune pretty much all happened in Melbourne. So um, I think just the spiritual experience of being in the desert there, I still carry with me and within the sound of my music um, wherever I go. So, you know, it's a spirit thing that follows you um, that you can recreate anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the track order? Was that super important to you? Yeah, it really was actually. I had this um, kind of vision that I wanted it to be sort of a single curve, the record with the centerpiece being the title track. Um, and I think that the album kind of achieves that. It took quite a lot of hard work figuring out where I wanted things to sit on the record, but I think it's it's come out a shape that I'm quite happy with, yeah. yeah. I, I think ending with What a Tender Thing was a brilliant idea. Oh, thank you. Did yeah. you uh, think that over a bit? That was, from the moment that we recorded that song, I was like, that's the last song on the record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, holding on the, the ones you love, the duet with Alan Power. Uh, tell me about Alan. So Alan Power, I initially um, was connected with through Jack Ladder. Um, I've known Jack for a while and he needed a female vocalist on Alan Power's record, which was actually being recorded at the Real World Studios in the UK, <laughs> which I thought was a nice little, you know, um, thing. And this was after I'd already been to Joshua Tree. So um, I guest sang on this record of Alan's and then when uh, we were going through the tracks and uh, holding on the ones you love just wasn't quite working and I was like I think it needs a male vocal and I'm, I emailed Alan and he was he sent something straight back and you know that's what you'll hear, hear on the record um, but Alan's like a really interesting sort of modern country troubadour from the UK just really odd kind of guy um, as far as UK sound goes I think he, he fits much better in Nashville or maybe in Melbourne yeah. Uh, is there a track uh, on the album that's closer to your heart than others? I have a really massive soft spot for Spend Your Christmas with Rita, um, only because we haven't played it much and, you know, it was one of the last songs that we finished off the record and um, no one's really heard it yet, so I'm very excited to share that with everybody. A little Christmassy number. Yeah. Uh, the album's coming out on Wally Kempton's Cheer Squad label, which mm -hmm. is really... Uh, growing, building all the time, that label. Why did you decide to go with Cheer Squad? Cheer Squad have been wanting to put this record out for a long time. And um, it was the first time that someone really, aside from just like pressing and printing the record was like, hey, we're gonna, you know, pay to market this thing well. And um, I just felt that the energy of that label and Wally, I've known since I was 18, um, felt really right, you know, like I felt really supported and believed in by them. So, you know, it just felt like the right move. Yeah. Is it a difficult album to transfer to a live setting? Or does the band need to change up their gear, for instance? Well, in this, uh, this setup that we have this evening, I feel like we achieve the sound pretty close to what it is. Although we don't have any keyboards or synths and stuff, we try and play it as live as possible, but there's, you know, strings, pedal steel, crunchy guitars, bass, drums, me, you know, it's, it's all the main factors are there. So yeah, I feel like it translates well to live. It's slightly different sound to the record, but it's something, you know, a live evolving sound I feel like is more exciting somehow than a record. 
Uh, yeah. uh, last time we spoke, you were playing uh, the 93 Fender Mustang and the, the Guild Traveller. Have you acquired any new gear since then? I have. One of them's in the shop at the moment, which is like this weird um, sort of gypsy jazz Ibanez acoustic from, I think it's like maybe the 80s, maybe early 90s. Um, it's got like one of those D-shaped sound holes. Um, and I've been playing Tommy Brooks Martin, he's like 70s Martin, which is just beautiful and I want it to be mine. Um, and I'm still playing my Guild, but I'm not playing as much electric guitar live at the moment, yeah. Uh, you told us last time also that uh, during lockdown you've written uh, about 30 songs uh, for the next album. I, I assume that song number has increased? Yeah, there's a few more now. I was actually just logging them the other day, trying to remember all the words for everything and going back through videos and notes on my phone and, you know, bit scraps of paper and stuff. And I've written out, I think, now maybe like 35 songs, but there's more than that that I haven't, haven't added to the list yet. So, yeah, there's plenty for the next, I don't know, four records or whatever. Yeah. Uh, will this next one be sonically different from this one? Yeah, it will actually. I'm hoping to kind of go down a path of slightly more, I don't know if you can, like listening to this record, you'll probably think it sounds maybe a little bit cinematic, but I, I want to make it more kind of epic. <laughs> um, and, you know, lean into that thing of like really telling stories, which is kind of my favourite part of songwriting. Um, I'll be working with Jack Ladder as the producer on this next one, so I'm interested to see where that takes us, but I'm also just like, open to finding our way with that as well, you know. I feel like a good artist always is evolving and um, I'm not sure what the next one will sound like, really. <laughs> um, if there was one artist uh, you look at and think, uh, that's the, the kind of career I want, that's the kind of artist I aspire to being, uh, who would that be? That would be Dolly Parton, yeah. You know, someone that has a prolific ability for writing music and songs. Um, and someone who is still performing, you know, huge shows at her age and uses her wealth for good and, you know, I just love Dolly Parton. I think she's a huge inspiration to a lot of people and especially to me, yeah. Yeah, and she helped us get through the pandemic. Absolutely. She's amazing. Uh, the Real World uh, is out on September 30. Uh, it's a beautiful album. Thank you. Um, it's been great to chat again. Lovely to chat to you too. Thanks for having me.